It says, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Be to God and amen, indeed. So I um, were completely aware of how we're arranged here in the sanctuary. Wanted to circulate something to you. I had thought about putting it up on the screen, but decided against it. I, I think it would have more impact the way I'm about to do it. So um, I wanted to share with you a lovely letter that I received. Um, so two weeks ago, I was invited to lead the memorial service at Pickersgill Retirement Community. Um, and this would be for the second time. I love doing the service. Uh, that uh, it's just, it's something that seems so special to the people there. They really seem to appreciate it. Uh, and it's always a packed house. I, you know, I, I didn't know what to expect going into it. I didn't expect it to be like that many people, but it's like a big deal for like this one day, all these folks gather together to honor those that have died in the last year at Pickersgill. So what I do is, it's a typical service, I just uh, get to a point in the service where I read the names aloud and then I encourage the staff or family members in attendance to offer a short remembrance. And uh, then I offer some very short words of comfort, much the same way as I would at a, a funeral. I, I tend not to go on and on at a funeral. Uh, maybe at church, I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, I usually don't hear from anybody after those services, because you know it's its own community. Um, but I received a very wonderful, and I would say very timely piece of mail that I just had to share with you today. So let me read it to you, and then I'm gonna circulate something uh, for you to look at. So it says, Reverend Dominguez, thanks so much for the beautiful memorial service for the deceased at Pickersgill Retirement Community. I really liked your homily or comments. On Sunday, this appeared in the comic section of the Baltimore Sun Papers. When I saw this family circus, I was reminded of your comments. So true. Please enjoy this comic strip about life not ending, but following us after passing um, and the way that we honor our loved ones. Thanks. And this is by uh, Miss Peggy Bumgartner of Pickersgill Independent Living. She was very careful to remind me that she was in independent living, which means something if you know anything about elder care. So this is from the Family Circus, and I'll just circulate it. Um, feel free to look at it and just hand it on down to a neighbor. Um, and I believe it will touch you, and I, and I wanted you to be able to just hold it in your hands and, and, and look at it yourself for the most, the greatest impact. So, um, and I just wanted to say, Ms. Bumgartner, I don't know if you're watching or will ever watch on YouTube, but if you are, I shared it. So there you go. So let me begin by saying that, you know, um, as we become adults, it's really funny how things that we never used to care about as kids or when we were younger, maybe things we even made fun of in our youth, suddenly become very important to us, almost cherished. Um, the Dominguez clan, and when I say clan, I mean clan, like I mean generations and generations of family, uh, had this tradition of getting together the weekend after Christmas. Uh, and it was always at like a very swanky venue. Um, 
generations would come together to eat, drink, and, you know, make merry. Uh, one of those things more than others, you know. And I, I have these memories of red-faced aunts and uncles toasting things I hardly remember, um, you know. And sitting around eating expensive food, you know, sour cream with caviar and toast points. And I was a little kid when I first started going, and I hated it. I, oh, my God, I, I hated going because the kids were really more of an afterthought at these soirees. Um, after a very long, very delicious, for them, dinner, half the food, I mean, the kids wouldn't want to touch anyway, um, it would be time at last for presents. And that was the part that the kids liked, right? Um, every part of the family was assigned someone else to get something for. And it became sort of a competition over the years. Like, these folks, they didn't care how much money they were throwing at these gifts. They wanted to be remembered as the one with the coolest gift that they gave. And it was a nice time because my relatives were rich. Uh, you know, that was, they, they did not seem to mind spending lots and lots of money for this moment alone. It was like a highlight for their year. So we'd all get our gifts and then the adults would just go back to making merry. And the kids were sort of just left to do what they needed to do to stay entertained, basically. <clears throat> now, as the kids became teenagers, and then adults, uh, it became increasingly apparent with every year that um, as the older generations continued to age, this tradition needed to be passed on. Somebody needed to pass on the torch. And I will say that in my youth, I was not interested in continuing it. Um, but I have to admit to you today that despite everything that I hated about those Dominguez Christmas parties, you know, the awkward conversations with relatives I only saw once a year, the, the random drunk aunt or uncle demanding way too much of my time, the pretentious food forced on the children, you know, despite all of that, I gotta tell you, I would do anything, anything at all to get that tradition back, yeah. But I know that I can't, you know. I know that I will, you know, even if I did somehow do it, it would never be the same as what I remember because many of those people are dead, you see? My father and mother included. Uh, those memories that I have in my head of those times, you know, I cherish those as an adult. And it's not so much the memories, the imagery I have in my head that is important, but the way that they made me feel. Now, I want to share that as a Mexican, I was raised with a very mocking attitude toward death. And when I say Mexican, what I really mean is a Mexican Christian. Uh, death was not something I was taught to fear at all. In fact, it was something to make fun of. Because in Christian tradition, you know, if you read your Bible closely, you will find, I believe, that God really doesn't believe in death. That's not in God's plan. You see, Jesus himself is confronted on this issue and in the Gospels proudly declares, God is not God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Those are the direct words of the, of the text. It wasn't until my adult years that I began to research the roots of that belief, uh, sometimes called the Christian future hope uh, or the resurrection of the dead. And uh, I, I began to appreciate them more and more. I almost turned them into um, like a sword of the spirit, if, if I could put it that way. It became like a mantra to me, something that would guide my steps. And I wanted to pass that on to my children so they would have no fear of death as well. And so I'm hoping that as I pass these beliefs on to you, as I've done for many churches now, uh, for the last five years, that they would be a source of inspiration and grace for you. So let me share with you kind of the roots of this tradition of Mexico, um, so you might have a sense of it, and how it ties into us, as our, uh, to our life as Christians. So in Mexico, on October the 31st, Mexicans celebrate the Day of the Dead, El Dia de los Muertos, uh, as one part of the Christian season of All Hallow Tide. Has anyone here ever heard of All Hallow Tide? 
it used to be a very important season in Christianity, but it kind of fell by the wayside. So ever wonder where Halloween comes from? Well, you're about to find out. Uh, in older times, this season is how we came to commemorate All Saints Sunday. And it was once a three-part season of the Christian year made up of All Hallows' Eve, so that's Halloween, All Saints' Day, and All Souls' Day. And this season was recognized throughout the world, but it took on a very unique flavor in Mexico as ethnic traditions combined with Spanish religious traditions. Now, there are a lot of traditions associated with the Day of the Dead, but the primary purpose is to remember our loved ones that have passed on. Fundamentally, I think the reason for the season is to remind us that to God, death is not an end and that we will one day see our loved ones again. Now to outsiders, the Day of the Dead can seem like a macabre celebration of death, you know, with all the painted skulls and the scary imagery, but the truth is that death is not being celebrated, not at all. In Mexican culture, death is just considered a natural part of life. Nothing lasts forever, as the saying goes when you go outside and you notice that all the leaves have fallen off the trees and they're colored differently, we don't sit here and lament about those things. In fact, we consider it to be quite beautiful, a normal part of nature in this part of the country. The same goes for this. It's also an opportunity, you know, to reflect on what death is. When death happens, yes, you can and should grieve it, of course. There is some loss of connection. But it's also an opportunity to cherish the memories of those that have gone on, to remember them as they were in life, not to obsess over their death. The Day of the Dead isn't really about death, you see. It's about life, and it gives us a way to make death less of a scary thing, especially for children. Now, growing up, my family didn't actively do a Day of the Dead celebration, because in the 80s, uh, there was a growing cultural movement called the Satanic Panic. Have you heard of this? Uh, that began to push back on things like Halloween and all the scary imagery. And unfortunately, a lot of misguided, uh, uninformed people took things a, a little too far. That included my parents. And my mom was a minister. But, you know, with those days in the past, thank God, um, more people than ever across the world are learning about this Mexican tradition and making it their own, which let me tell you, as a Mexican, that just warms my heart. It is so beautiful to see people adopting those customs. Now, moving from California to Maryland, you can imagine it really stirred in me a need to um, remain connected with the traditions of both sides of my family, the American side and the Mexican side. So from 2011 to this day, you know, each year on Halloween, I've celebrated El Dia de los Muertos in my own way. Uh, I still remember the first time I decorated my car's trunk for a trunk or treat event, um, and people were very curious about it. This was in Howard County. They were asking me about all the imagery, you know, the skulls, and oh, why do you have all those photos up? Who, are those your loved ones? Are they dead? What's going on? Some had heard about it, you know. And I would arrange an ofrenda, so that's one of the central traditions, as you heard in the children's message of the Day of the Dead. You create an altar, traditionally three tiers high. In some churches, they decorated the very altar in the middle of the sanctuary uh, for today's event. Um, now, upon it would be photos of the loved ones being honored. It was surrounded also by cultural icons of the tradition. So the, the marigolds, or sempasuchil, the calaveras, the skulls, and uh, those things that were beloved by your loved ones in life. And for a while, on my ofrenda, the biggest photo centrally located was one of my dad. I'm going to bring it for next week so you can see it. Um, it was one of my dad, my brothers, and I at our family's old ranch in Santa Paula, California. We used to own 181 acres up there. I think I saw it one time when I was like really little. Um, 
never really had a chance to enjoy it or anything like that. Sold for a pittance, I must say. Um, and this image is of uh, these multiple generations of kids with their dad standing in front of the rusted out wreck of a truck that my father and his brother had crashed on the ranch many years ago. And uh, I must say it was really funny when we saw it because it had a lot of bullet holes in it so it became a very you know, convenient target for target shooting, you know? It was really cool. Um, I actually saved the license plate and I still have it with me to this day. Uh, adorning the altar is the Sempasuchil, so the Mexican marigold, and it's a flower that is said in ethnic tradition to serve as a bridge for the spirits of our loved ones as they begin their journey from the afterlife to pay a visit for one night each year to the family altar on All Hallows' Eve or Halloween or El Dia de los Muertos. These are all just different ways of saying the same thing. And leaving, you know, things like food out for them, you know, much the same way that we would live at, leave out milk and cookies for Santa, you know. These gifts were usually food that the ones being remembered loved in life. Or, and I love this tradition the most, um, had a humorous story attached to them. So let me give you an example. My dad had a voracious sweet tooth, but oddly enough, his favorite sweets were fruit pies and fig newtons. Fig newtons, why? Um, he also really enjoyed these disgusting oval-shaped cans of sardines and tomato sauce. Have you seen these at the supermarket with the rest of the canned seafood? Like, who buys that stuff, man, you know? Like, I'll tell you who, my father, that's who. Yeah, he loved to put it on rice. My mom, uh, she drank Kroger freeze-dried decaf coffee like it was water. I'm like, what are you doing? Just drink the water, like, whatever. So I put a small jar of it on the altar for her. And my mom also loved cheese on the block, any kind of cheese. So, you know, I bought a little something fancy that would be able to go up on the, on the altar there. And both my parents loved pan dulce, Mexican sweet bread. So I'd put some up there too, especially pan de muerto, or bread of the dead. As I mentioned to the kids, it's like a little bun with like a cross on the top. Now, as I've shared these traditions with the churches that I've served, folks have absolutely fallen in love with them. Uh, and I keep hearing the same thing again and again. You know, I, I just wish there was something like that in America. Well, there is, uh, if you'd stop making All Saints so somber. I mean, there is a beautiful element to recognizing our loved ones in the midst of communion, reading the names and tolling a bell in some churches, absolutely. But, um, you know, there is an occasion for celebration as well, and so I really wanted to do that with all of you. That's why we're having this, hopefully, a feast next Sunday um, after the service. And I must say, you know, Dia de los Muertos doesn't belong to Mexicans. Uh, we believe Mexicans should be shared throughout the world. And so, you know, if, if it's something that is life-giving to you as you explore it, you might consider making a tradition out of taking time to remember the impact that your loved ones, now gone from this life, had on you. Even if it's just a private celebration. I know it helped me. You know, I, I think if the Day of the Dead can teach us anything, it's really to look at every person and every day as a, as a gift, you know, uh, a gift that we should be grateful for. None of us know the future. Um, we don't know how much time we have to cherish with our loved ones. And I will say, speaking from personal experience, death can be a tough pill to swallow. Um, I see as a pastor, so many folks get really mad. And maybe mad or anger isn't the right word there. It's almost like bitterness um, after they lose somebody. You know, they, these individuals will look for um, someone or something to blame. And that's, that's normal, you know? Loss is real. It's a real thing that we feel, you know? They may even curse God and, and the people around them. Death transforms them into bitter people, you know, because they can't bring themselves to accept a new reality without their loved one in it. 
They can't bring themselves to accept that their life is different now. And instead of honoring the dead, you know, remembering them as the gifts they were, these angry people focus almost exclusively on what they've lost to the point that the memory of their loved one becomes poison in their veins. Even if in the worst cases, death may have been the greatest comfort their loved one could be afforded, you know, as an end to their pain. I gotta tell you, I've seen a lot of people at bedsides pleading with God, please don't take my beloved, please don't take my loved one, who may be in a lot of obvious pain. And they beg the doctors to take the most aggressive forms of treatment to preserve life, never stopping to think that the life that they're seeking to preserve might not have any quality left in it, obsessed as they are over its quantity. You know, I used to think that way myself, preserve life at all costs. You know, I even convinced myself that God wants that from us. But you know, after many years of ministry, I have developed a very different perspective when it comes to ministry to the dying and their families. And so what I can tell you out of that experience is this. God doesn't want us in pain. You know, God hates death. And God is working to redeem death every single day as God works to redeem all the consequences of our sin, transforming something awful into something good. That is what God does. That is redemption. That is God's work. God can't help God's self in doing that. It is God's very nature. And God did this with the Son of Man, you know, who didn't stay nailed to a cross but rose again. I mean, I really want you to think about that symbol hanging up there. Who puts a symbol of death at the forefront of a holy place? We've been doing that for generations. I mean, it's not like we call caskets objects of inspiration. We don't wear them on our necks. So why do they hang in our sanctuaries? Because they hang there empty. They are an open mockery of the forces of death that sought to kill a savior. The cross is empty and God laughs. And so should we in the face of death. Not to disparage a serious situation or, or anyone's feelings, but to remember that death is not an end. It is not the end. And that the cross is empty for a reason. So if you struggle with death, let me tell you, this tradition of Day of the Dead has your name on it. The God behind it speaks to you directly. God has given us the gift of life and a love so profound that death itself cannot diminish it. We may not be able to interact with our deceased loved ones in the manner that we want to, but that does not mean that our connection to them is lost. Not at all. I mean, if you can for a moment entertain the notion that you don't have everything figured out and allow yourself the chance to accept the future hope of all Christians, that is the resurrection of the dead, I think you will feel a sense of weight fall off your shoulders because God has got us. And I believe God will smile at you for making the attempt. Now next week, if you haven't done so already, bring a photo of your honored dead to adorn our altar. You know, feel free to drop by during the week to add it if you wish, and maybe even to offer prayer. I'll be here, you know. And be sure to let the office or myself know if you'd like your loved one's name included in the bulletin for next week's All Saints commemoration. And might I say, invite a friend who might be having a hard time with death to join you as we honor our dead and feast together. Death does not have to be an occasion only for sadness. It can be an occasion for joy too. Praise be to God and amen.